Hello and welcome to the Odds Checker Royal Ascot preview. We are previewing Friday here. So day four of Royal Ascot. No fans there this year, sadly. Can't don my tails and top hat this summer, at least not at Royal Ascot, that is. Um, but I'm joined by two experts here to try and steer you towards some winners on the Friday. We've got Odds Checker's newest tipster, Daryl Carter, who provides a daily nap exclusive to the Odds Checker app. How are you doing, Daryl? Very well, thanks, George. How are you? Good, thank you. And we've got racing broadcaster and journalist Ed Quigley, Longshot Ted, on Twitter as well. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us today, Ed. No worries. Great to be here. Great to be here. Royal Ascot, wonderful, isn't it? Absolutely wonderful. I was actually going to play golf uh, near Ascot on Thursday, and for ages I wasn't going to play because I hate getting that train up to Ascot. Mm. Uh, when it's full of people. And I was like, I can't handle it. And then I suddenly remembered that actually there wouldn't be any people because there aren't going to be any fans. So I'm now working out whether or not I should play again. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So before we get into the tipping, just to, as ever, steer you in the direction of the Odds Checker app. If you're somebody who wants to get the best prices, wants the best bookie offers, wants the best tipsters around, including Daryl and, of course, Andy Holding, who sadly can't be with us today, it is an absolute no-brainer to download the Odds Checker app. So I would do so right away. Also, this is the Friday podcast. We've done one for Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. We'll shortly be recording Saturday as well. And they're all up on our YouTube page as well. So if you like what you hear here, or if you haven't heard those ones and the racing is still to come, make sure you direct yourself there to get all you need to know about every day of Royal Ascot with Odds Checker. On now to the first race of Friday. This is Friday the 19th of June. I had to read this a few times to make sure I got the name right. The Palace of Holly Roodhouse Stakes rolls right off the tongue, this one. Uh, this is the first race of the day. Art Power is the 7-2 favourite. Will to win 10-1. to one. Golden Dragon and Maystar alongside Dancing in the Street 14-1. to one, As is Ainsdale and Never Dark 16-1 to one bar. So many horses currently here, Daryl. You, you and I did the Tuesday pod last Friday when the field sizes were pretty similar. <clears throat> and um, I think as ever, this is maybe one where you're just circling a couple of horses to keep an eye on before before the race cuts up. So, Daryl, is there anything that you wanted to just maybe point towards at this stage? Yeah, I think this is pretty straightforward. I think the group horse in the handicap is no doubt Art Power off a of mark of 97. I think... It, if he reproduces that performance at Newcastle that he did on his reappearance, that he's going to be very, very tough to beat, even dropping da- back down to five furlongs. I think that is probably a good move. He shows plenty of early speed out the gate. I can't really have anything in here that's that well handicapped enough to who's going to overthrow a group horse uh, at the head of the market. Now, he has got an entry in the Commonwealth later, uh, earlier in the week. So it would be interesting to see where he goes. But if he comes in here off of Mark 97, he's got to be of massive interest here. So obviously, if you bat to now at seven and two, and he ends up going for the Commonwealth, you do your money. But yeah. if he stays in, what kind of prize could you see up power going off? Well, look, there's 26 entered. There's 24 maximum field. It, we'll probably get a maximum field in the, in this race. I mean, I think it would be no surprise to see up power around three to one, perhaps going off even shorter than that on the day if he comes in here. That would be my opinion. I think he's a very good horse. I think he's a group horse. Three to one. So probably you're better off here just waiting, biding your time. Take the shorter price if he's there rather than risking uh, doing your cash. Ed, any thoughts? <clears throat> no strong views. I, I think, yeah, Art Power is going to be rated 100 plus sooner rather than later. Just a question of when, uh, when pretty convincingly, it has to be said. Uh, I think Newcastle last time out. It was just one I, I kind of circled without really knowing why I did it. But um, <laughs> it's never it's never Archie Watson horse. But Maystar is quite mm-hmm. interesting. He was last seen was beating the neck in a listed race in France. That was over six. And this horse has almost in recent times pretty much been campaigned over even up to a mile and over six and seven furlongs. But it always, to me, has shown plenty of early dash. I, I, I kind of am, in a way, quite happy. They are coming back to the minimum trip of this horse because I think the stiff five probably will suit. Probably a bit of each way value. Again, this is a horse they've been scratching around with almost to find the best trip with this animal. And I said it was an extended six in France last time. And I actually thought was they rode it pretty promptly and actually thought the petrol light to some extent came on, which given that the horse sees out a mile, is, is, it was a little bit unusual. And so it is really interesting, the fact they're bringing this horse back to five furlongs. I think it was early on in its two-year-old campaign was the last time it ran over that sort of distance. So I wouldn't be at all surprised, given that they rode this horse 
uh, promptly last time out in France. That back to the minimum trip, Holly Doyle just pings this one out in front and then tries to, to, to go from the front, if you see what I'm saying. But um, yeah, I, I don't think the horse is particularly well handicapped, even coming back into handicap company. It, it, it's a question of what price um, Tim Easterby's horse goes off, isn't it, really? Uh, mm. I, I, as you know, not really for me to be getting stuck into something in it, nine to four in a handicap, even if they are the, the group horse, because they've only got to get the gap open at the wrong time or something stupid happen at Royal Ascot and you, you get a bit of egg on your face. But uh, no denying, I think that will be the best horse in the race this season. On the day, perhaps uh, May Star. I'm just I'm drawn by the fact they've come back to five. The horse is obviously showing them plenty of speed at home, and I say, given the Archie Watson team are arguably the most informed yard in in the country at the moment, uh, that would be my tentative each way play. Yeah, Andrew Balding would have something to say about that, but but I get your point, um, and I love the idea that that if May Star does win this, it would have won uh, over at Southall at Doha and then at Royal Ascot. I would love to, I would love to own a horse that wins at those three venues, I must say. But uh, but Maystar, 14 to 1. I should add, I should have said at the top of the show as well, we are recording this at 11 o'clock on Monday morning. So that's why the field sizes uh, are a little bit bigger um, and we're having to be a little bit speculative in terms of, of you know, we're recording this before the declaration. So we're just having to be a little bit speculative with some of the races, especially the big handicaps where we can expect a fair few to come out, but Maystar currently fourteen to one. That's with Labrook's uh, Art Power uh, getting a yeah a, a good write up. It's fair to say from these two at seven to two, but just be wary that no guarantee that he runs here. And because we're before declarations, you would lose your money if he is a non-runner. Um, the Albany next up, and we've got more beautiful at nine to four. Uh, flying Al uh, Aletha. Is uh, nine to two, I think. Yeah, nine to two, best price in the moment. Uh, Satahi eight to one, twelve to one. Bar um, again, a fair few in there down the field at bigger prices too before the race cuts up. Ed, coming to you first here, another short price favourite for you to to get against. Yeah, this is one where I have a, a sip of coffee and a Maya Darrell's uh, lockdown haircut, I think, from each of you. I'm, um, yeah. <laughs> I'm, uh, I knew you was going to say uh, something about it. Very, very smart. Very, no, I, I can't talk. I can't. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm happy. I, I haven't got the longest hair on the uh, on the video, which I'm delighted about. <laughs> I have. I'm just trying to hide it. I'm, yeah. not quite, I'm, I'm not quite a Jack Grealish kind of territory yet, but I was thinking about it. It's, go, it's going that way. But um, no, uh, I'm Ryan Asker, Jack Grealish, I, my two favourite things. So. There we go. Absolutely. Go hand in hand, don't they? And uh, that goes hand in hand with me sitting out this race, uh, to be honest with you. I've gone through it and um, I don't know where I'm going. So I'll just be wasting uh, viewers' time listening to my opinion on this. I don't know where I was going. I'm pretty sure that was Jack Grealish's excuse for being caught out and about during lockdown. Um, Darryl... You're not wrong. You're not wrong. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is uh, I mean, like, like Ed said, it's a guess up race, really. I mean, more beautiful, big, powerful yard. It was really impressive on debut. Looked like step up the sixth fellow would definitely suit. Um, hard to take on, I guess, from what we've seen from the others. I think he'd know where he was at with his own stable. But again, they can take such a big step forward next time out. No one actually really knows. Setter, he, for Roger Berrier, was quite impressive. Came from last to first in debut. It was a bit of a slow time, but um, coming from last to first means it's probably more impressive than it first looked. One tap of the stick and, and the, the response was instant. That horse is definitely going to take a step forward. Uh, it's around eight to one. I wouldn't be getting overly excited about this race myself, Ed. So... Um, it wouldn't be a betting race for me, but I can see why most beautiful, more beautiful is at the favourite, is ahead in the market rather. But um, not a strong opinion, I'm afraid, George. Yeah, absolutely fine. As we always say, much better to be honest and say not a strong opinion than tipping up something that you wouldn't necessarily back yourself or don't fancy enough to tip. So as it stands at the moment, <clears throat> the Albany uh, is a no bet race for these two lads. I'm sure come Friday morning when Andy Holdings' um, write up is out. He's not a man to shy away from any race, so I reckon he might have something for us there come the day. And maybe, Daryl, as the race cuts up, you may do too, depending on what happens and how the market goes. Uh, the Norfolk next, it's worth saying, before we came on air, um, the two lads, Daryl and Ed, both said that this wasn't necessarily their favourite punting day. And you can see why, because it is a bit of a minefield, especially at the moment. Uh, Eye of Heaven is a 7-2 to favourite currently for the Norfolk. Uh, Golden Powell, 6-1. to one. Uh, Lip Zana seven to one, Admiral Nelson eight to one, alongside the Learjet, who is as short as five to one elsewhere. Um, all those horses I've just mentioned, basically all very, very much blue on odds checker, suggesting they're all probably likely to go for this and will make up the crux of the market. 
Uh, Merchant's Key, 12 to 1 with an Imperial Force. Jojo Rabbit, 14 to 1 alongside Talbot. And a very interesting runner at 14 to 1, uh, Chief Little Hawk. 14 to 1 currently with Betfair and Paddy Power, as short as 13 to 2 and 6 to 1 with Coral and Skybet. So, really, that is one example there where, why you should use the Odds Checker app or use the Odds Checker grids online because if you're taking 7 to 1, 13 to 2, about a 14 to 1 shot then um, you can see where the value really is. It's an odds checker. Uh, Daryl, enough of my corporate spiel there. And let's, um, you know, why don't, why don't you let us know what you reckon for the for the Norfolk? Christ. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I was quite impressed with Admiral Nelson, um, actually. I thought five furlongs was the bare minimum for the horse, though. I thought that horse would definitely be going up in trip. Um, again, there is not a lot in here f- for me to really comment on. Um, you've got a few that are double entered all over the place. So this mm. might cut up quite a bit. Um, this race, so this will be a wait for the day. I, I was impressed with Admiral Nelson. I must admit, um, probably the smartest two, uh, performance of a two-year-old that I've seen. I I thought that took me, um, you know, quite by surprise. I, I like that. I think he's got tons more to come. I wouldn't be getting involved, not yet. This field is definitely going to cut up quite, quite a fair bit. So no bet for Daryl Ed. No, no bet here. I'm going to work on my Jack Greedy share cut again during, <laughs> during this one. That's it. No, um, sitting this one out happily. Interesting what you did say, though, with regards to Chief Little Hawk. Obviously, there's a bit of a guessing game uh, mm. at the time of recording with the Aidan O'Brien, Aidan O'Brien kind of runners and everything. So, yeah, I'm sitting this one out. Yeah, Chief Little Hawk's entered for the Windsor Castle as well as the Norfolk. Um, so impressive, of course, on debut. Um, uh, as basically any horse that is entered into the Norfolk is going to be. Should be the... You know, amongst the best two-year-olds going will win this race. But at the moment, we don't have much of an idea of who's running who's running where. Um, but Admiral Nelson there, um, very, very impressive on debut for Daryl. Eight to one with Betfair and Paddy Power, as short as nine to two elsewhere. So if you're desperate to get involved now, if you need to have a bet on the Norfolk, maybe that would be one way to go. But as ever, remember that if the horse does come out at this stage, um, that will be you losing your stake it's on to the hardwick now and i'm not going to let you get away with saying no bet here because we know about these horses everything's laid out for you there's got to be some value here surely anthony van dyke is the nine to four favorite alarcam alongside the dragon at nine to two defoe is eight to one uh magic one nine to one or persian ten to one fleeting and fanny logan and hamish all 12 to one 14 to one bar come on lads find us a bet i'm going to open it to the floor one of you. Yeah, go on then. I'll lead off. We'll go. Hey. <laughs> no, uh, in each race play, I'm actually, I'm, Logan. she's got a bit to find on official ratings. Frankie de Tourie's on. Anyone who saw the uh, Haydock run last time out, uh, how should we say? She was given a very sympathetic ride. Um, held up and the Rab Havlin, <laughs> even many favourite, wasn't really asked a serious question in all, in all truth. But what I'm saying is I think she was ridden with sympathy with in mind of, look, there are bigger days ahead. Uh, let's not first time out on the you know a first run since last November. Let's not go to the bottom of it. Really interested to see her because I just think obviously since the headgear went on, she's been an absolute revelation. They put the hood on her and when she rattled up four or five on the bounce or whatever, obviously she's going up in grade and now she's in the big leagues. But I also think the trip angle as well again is something I'll come back to a bit of a theme of my my way I'm looking at Royal Ascot. She'd been campaigned over a mile and a quarter. And every time I think she was just giving an indication that she wanted to go further. And as I said, that kind of goes hand in hand with my view of she ran over just shy of a mile and a half on her comeback. It was her first time at that trip. It was her first run for, you know, seven months or whatever. I just think that was a bit of a, a it was a, a nice prep run in, in, in all honesty for this. As I said, on official figures, yes, yeah, she's got a bit to find. She's got to find 10, 12 pound or she, she gets the Phillies allowance. Frankie the Tories on. Uh, I just think it's a bit of a muddling contest. I think she's an each-way play because she's unexposed over middle distances. Obviously, the Gorston Yard, are, uh, uh, they're absolutely flying again. Uh, now, I was looking at the stats. Actually, Archie Watson is miles ahead of Andrew Balding just to... Uh, just to, <laughs> who, just, just, just to uh, as soon as we're dealing with facts. But um, John, Gorston, <laughs> John, John Gorston is actually a trainer. Again, he's operating at 31% at the time of recording, uh, as is with uh, John. The, the Yard absolutely flying. But Fanny Logan... I don't think she's as good as others in here, or how shall I say, she's not had the opportunity to prove she's as good as others, but I think she will improve this season with time. I think she will improve from mile and four, and even by the end of the season, I could see her going up to mile and six. Uh, I think she would 
definitely needed the run on her comeback. She was ridden with this race in mind. Frankie the Tory takes over the steering here, and I, I think she could run a, a, a good race from an each way perspective. So Fanny Logan, 12 to 1. I think I was letting my bias come in the way between me and Archie Watson there because every single Archie Watson first time out two-year-old teams to win, except for the one that I back called Science, <laughs> which got beaten in a head bob with, uh, with, a, with a Mark Johnson horse. One of those Mark Johnson horses that you just cannot go past. Um, so that is obviously clouding my judgment there. Very sorry, Archie, and to Holly as well. 12 to 1, Fanny Logan, uh, Sky Vets, Betfair and Paddy Power. Uh, for the Hardwick, Daryl. What I mean, let's let's let's. I mean, just keeping on the theme as we have done in the other podcasts. Anthony Van Dyke, nine to four favourite. Boom or bust. Boom. Boom. Absolute brilliant value for a favourite <laughs> in this. Um, I think Aiden's put magic wand in here to set this up because this trip is definitely short of her best. Um, she's going to set this up off the front end, make it a strong test for Anthony Van Dyke. Um, look, if you go back through Anthony Van Dyke's runs, I thought he was brilliant last time out at Newmarket behind Gaia, the runaway leader. I thought he did well to stay on there. I think that'll put him spot on for this. The time before that um, at Chartin, uh, it was first time blinkers, poor run. The time before that, he was third in the San Anita, uh, San Anita in a Breeders' Cup turf, which is a cracking bit of form. The time before that, he's running over a mile and a, a mile and a quarter too short behind Magical, even though he ran extremely well, beating only two and a half lengths. Time before that, he ran poorly at Ascot um, behind Enable, but that was first time cheek pieces. Then you're behind, then you go behind that in, your, in the Irish Derby and uh, he was beaten six lengths by Sovereign in one of the weirdest races you'll ever see <laughs> in, in your life. Um, and he was held up well off the pace. Before that, he's, in, he's won the Derby. Look, there's plenty of excuses for him, mm. I think. I think, he, he should be winning this. If he doesn't win this, there's no no excuses for him. He's had the excuses with the headgear and the shorter trips. He's going to be spot on here. He's the top rated in the field. He's still improving. He's going to have pace guaranteed. There's just a lot to like about Anthony Van Dijk. And I think he should be shorter than the 9-4, to four, to be honest with you. Um, Ella Khan's interesting for me, though. This horse shaped last year in a Judmont like he wanted to step up to a mile and a half. And then he shapes like he doesn't want to step up to, to a mile and a half. So it, <laughs> he's, he's a hard one to work out for all he is talented. I can forgive him that run at Haydock first time out. He just took a bit of a blow. Lord North come up side of him and then he, he ran on again. But I think Anthony Van Dyke at, at nine to four, he will not be nine to four on the day. Not that, a Darryl, chance. Darryl, you're, not, you're just worried he's becoming an excuse horse. Like every no, race, there uh, seems to be an excuse for him. Like, you see what I'm saying? Like, no doubt he's got yeah. class, but... Yeah, I see what you're saying, but I think there's valid reasons. I think he obviously doesn't like headgear, you know, but if you look at his runs over this trip without headgear, mm. would any of these finish third in the Breeders' Cup turf at Santa Anita? No. Um, you know, his run behind Magical at Leopardstown uh, last year in the Champion Stakes, you know, he wasn't beaten far over, over a trip too short. I think if you look at his runs over a mile and a half, I think they're, they're plenty good enough to, to be winning this. This is also a drop into a Group 2 company. Yep. <laughs> so I think there's plenty to like. I really do. And I hate an Aiden O'Brien favourite. As we found out. Uh, yeah, it's a 9-4 to four <laughs> anti-Van Bikers at the moment with Labrooks and Coral and VBET as well. Um, so 9-4 to four you're getting at the moment. Daryl thinks that's cracking value. Alarcam gets a positive mention as well at 9-2. to two. And um, Fanny Logan, the one for John Gosden at 12 to 1 for Ed. Uh, the Commonwealth Cup now, Pierre Lapin is the 4 to 1 favourite. Uh, Kimari, 8 to 1. Wooded, 10 to 1. Mill Isle, 14 to 1. Very disappointing in the Guineas. Uh, final song, 16 to 1. Mum's Tipple, 16 to 1. Uh, and a couple of horses further down the market, which I'm seeing now. I think Golden Horde. And Lope Fernandez currently showing at 16 to 1, but I don't think that price is going to be around by the time this podcast goes out because it's much, much shorter elsewhere. So they, we can add those into the ones I mentioned at the top end. Um, Daryl, what are we thinking? Uh, tr very tricky race. Uh, quite, a, quite a good looking race, actually, um, for the Commonwealth Cup. Pierre Lapin, you can see why he's favourite. He's unexposed in the two starts. I thought for sure they was going to step him up to seven furlongs after last year. Uh, I'm very disappointed that they're not running Malatru in this race. Um, extremely disappointed. But I can see why Pierre Lapin's favourite. Will I be backing him at four to one? 
Perhaps not. Uh, I think there's one at a bit of a price in here. Royal Crusade for Charlie Appleby that I like. Um, he had three good runs last year, just beating the net by threat over seven. He's got a very quick action, very low gliding action. Um, I think the drop back to um, six furlongs is definitely a big positive for him. I would be leaning towards him at this stage at around 16, 20 to one. Lope Fernandez in there, another Aino Brian but I couldn't have him. He just doesn't want to do it. He's a high <laughs> head carriage. He just he's one of these horses that just downs tools when he gets to the front. Um, there's a lot of exciting horses in here. So, you know, you could probably make a case for nine or ten of these, I would I would say. Um, so it wouldn't be the most confident bet, but I'll probably have a little bit each way at Royal Crusade on return here. Royal Crusade twenty to one, as you mentioned. Uh, with a few firms, Betfair, Hills, Skybet, Unibet, Paddy Power. Uh, so, yeah, that is for Royal Crusade. Ed, the Commonwealth, who's the Commonwealth winner? Well, the vibes are it probably isn't going to run. However, not knowing the final decks, if it does line up, Mum's Tipple is the horse I've got to be in a bonnet about at the moment. I've got to be honest <laughs> with you. I, I'm still, I, I, there's a lot bigger things in life to get worried about than um, what triple horse is running over. But um, <laughs> as you can tell, this tends to be a theme. Why on earth did Mum's Tipple run in the 2000 Guineas? Uh, this horse is all speed. I mean, look, the win of his York race, the form of it, you know, the four manor acts will go, ah, 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 didn't do this, didn't do that. Just sit and watch that York run. It, it was the most visually impressive win of any horse I saw last season. Absolutely annihilated the field. If you want form, the form of his Ascot Maiden before that when he won has worked out an absolute treat. I think the second, third, fourth, fifth and sixth have now all come out and won and some pretty good contests. He then went to Middle Park uh, where he ran no race at all, came back lame on his off four and they said he didn't handle Newmarket. So what do you do? You step him up to a mile. First time out in the 2000 Guineas, he ran with the choke out. He was really free. He stopped in a heat. The petrolite came on. He came last. Uh, the you know, I was looking at the what was said to the stewards. He hated the track. Uh, words to that effect were basically said. And I'm um, I'm confused because you listened to Richard Hannon Jr.'s comments only six weeks ago. It was the comment. All things revolve around the Commonwealth Cup. And considering they had threat in the yard, who looked the natural horse to step up to one mile, mm. he ends up swerving the two thousand guineas, and he run what I view as a sprinter over a mile. I'm absolutely flummoxed. If Mum's Tipple ran in this. Back it at sprint, back at a course where he's won at, back over sprint distances. If you knew he was lining up, we'll put it this way, he wouldn't be anywhere near 20 to 1 when he lines up. He will crash. But the vibes are they're probably going to give him a bit more time to get over Newmarket, I gather. But it just seems a shame to me because this race looks absolutely tailor made for him. Uh, just that York run was scintillating. I'd just love to see him back at six away from Newmarket because he clearly does not like that venue. Do, do we have any idea why why he ran there? I mean, as you say, <clears throat> just looking at the comments, Richard, Richard Hannon saying he didn't appreciate the undulations in the track. Well, I think we saw that in the previous run as well, didn't we? So, I mean, what would you, I mean, what what would you reckon is the reason for them? Basically, what I'm trying to say is, are you put off at all by the yard decision in order to step them up and chip the way the way they did? I mean, I'm not privy to the information of why that the how that came about, whether it was known as decision or a kind of joint decision, how that came about. But I, I just find it quite strange, given that it almost contradicts the previous quotes of what the trainer was saying. And there's obviously a reason why they've gone and done that. And uh, but it's also just got so much kind of raw speed. Uh, I, I didn't. At what point was he ever going to stay, see a mile out? If you see what I'm saying, just my 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 point of view. So if he did come back to six. I wouldn't be too worried the fact he bombed out um, in the 2000 Guineas because he was beaten so far out. He didn't really have much of a race in the end, to be honest with you. So if he runs in this, Mum's Tipple, I will be backing him. But uh, let's say the vibes are perhaps they're going to swerve this and wait for a later target. But that, that would be my bottom line on this one. The exchange market sometimes tell us a little bit about whether or not horses are going to run. And the last price that Mum's Tipple was matched at, it was 14. So mm. somebody somewhere thinking that maybe... The plan is still the Commonwealth Cup, but as you say, not an ideal prep run in the 2000 Guineas, uh, not a suitable one at least uh, a couple of weekends ago. Uh, on now to the Queen. Actually, I'll just give you the prices there as well. Mum's tipple, 16 to 1 best price with Bet365, uh, as short as 8 to 1 uh, with Betfair Sportsbook. Uh, the Queen's Vars now. The Queen's Vars and Berkshire Rocco is a 7 to 2 favourite ahead of Al Dabaran, uh, 5 to 1 Santiago ahead of Nobel Prize. Uh, Dawn Patrol eight to one, Born with Pride twelve to one, uh, On Guard. I mean, 
I'm not going to say he's not going to run because when I did that last year with Blue Point, um, <laughs> we all know what happened there. But, but it's all I'll say is there's 14 to one available and there's four to one available, and I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, order Order of Australia 14 to one, 20 to one punctuation. Uh, yeah, Ed, I'll, Ed, I'll come to you here to start with. Anything taking your fancy in the Queen's Vars? Um, well, was, there was just one I circled after his run last time. And that was Sound of Cannons for Brian Meehan. He ran in the uh, ran English King in the Lingfield Derby trial, finished fourth. Mm. Look, looked like a horse who just absolutely hated that venue. Obviously, Lingfield being almost chalk and cheese compared to Ascot in terms of its characteristics. And uh, looked awkward, kept changing its legs, didn't like the twists and turns. And But to his credit, I mean, looked like he was going to have a race with the ambulance for last at one point, but did actually pick up and, and, and show some kind of a bit of metal, I think it has to be said, in, in the closing stages. It was beaten 10 lengths in fourth, don't get me wrong, but looked like a horse who, A, wants to come as far away from a, a tight track as possible, and B, I think a mile six, again, the trip angle here on a more galloping track would bring out improvement. Official ratings suggest the horse isn't, you know, the, the official assessor took a fairly positive view of that. Uh, I mean, you've got Al Dabrahan, 107, and Mark Rocco, obviously... Uh, 104. This horse has been given a mark of 103. If you know, if it were going to go in the handicap company, so not that far off these. And I do think again, unexposed or up in trip would bring around further improvement. Uh, again, we don't quite know the exact field size and who's lining up here, but Sound of Cannons is definitely a looks a proper stair in the making. And uh, just just hated Lingfield last time out. Mm. Totally the wrong track for him. Sound of Cannons 25 to one. Enjoying Ed. Telling trainers they've sent their horses to the wrong places. It's what this podcast is all about, lads. Um, <laughs> you won't be having me back again. You won't be yeah, I know, we will be. This, this is what we like. No, normally, I try and book people when we're doing it around the table with Andy, who, who are going to take Andy on. We, we want conflict. Uh, when everyone's agreeing, it's not fun. The, the wider point was it was a fact-finding mission, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. So you essentially go there to find out, was, was Sound of Cannons an Epsom horse? And in terms of class, no. And in terms of like the idiosyncrasies the track found out, no. The fact they're going up massively in trip onto a galloping track is pretty much that race answered everything they need to know in terms of what at least what type of horse they've got on their hands. And so, yeah, I think Santa Cannons from each way perspective, again, I say it's a bit unsure as to the makeup of the race, but I wouldn't be at all surprised that, that horse uh, finished in the frame at a big price. Santa Cannons, 25 to 1 with Unibet. Daryl, what do you like? I actually... I actually agree with. Yes. Oh, what's Hello. going on? Yeah. I, said, I, said I, I said I want conflict, but when you're both agreeing on a 25 to one shot, that is absolutely fine. Yeah, no, no, I do agree. I, I agree with everything you said. Um, I really do. I've got nothing more to add to it. Is that, <laughs> I think Darryl, I was the, Yeah. Do you agree, or have you just forgotten to research this race and you thought to yourself, "I'm just going to agree with whatever it says here." <laughs> no, no, no. Honestly, he, he was. He's been in my tracker since his run at Haydock. Um, behind power driving on the soft ground. I've always thought that step up and trip would certainly suit. And I really fancied English King when he ran the other day, but Sander Cannons really did catch my eye. He didn't look like he had. There was a few horses that day that didn't handle Lingfield at all. Sander Cannons was one of them. Um, the other were, was West End Girl and um, Miss Yoda. There was three horses that really didn't handle the track that day. So um, I, I do agree. I, I couldn't believe he was such a big price, really. If you forgive him that, he's progressive. Uh, he's racing post ratings, but progressive. He's going to have more to come um, over the, over this sort of trip. Uh, and I think those at the top of market are, are worth taking on. Al Dabaran, I feel like they're clutching at straws a little bit with this horse now. Mm. Um, I said before, he's got such a short, rabby stride. He either wants a, a drop back and trip or very soft ground for me. Um, so I couldn't have him. You, I mean, you're, you're struggling to say these Aidan O'Brien runners are, are at the top of his list, I think, um, at, the, at the moment. Uh, Ber Berkshire Rocco, for me, it's probably sets the standard, but it's not high enough to, to be backing him at a short price of 7-2 to two in this field, personally. So I, I, I agree. I mean, 25 to 1 about Santa Cannons, each way play there. There's nothing wrong with that. In a race, that could throw up any sort of result, really, with a lot of lightly raced horses. So, yes, George, I do agree. <laughs> <laughs> Santa Cannons already. PJ McDonald jocked up as well. Um, and worth noting as well, back in October, was sent over to San Clue to try and nick some French prize money in a Group 1 as well and finish six lengths back. Not suggesting by any means that's Group 1 form, but always interesting, I think, when trainers send horses over to try and do that. It means they must be held in some 
kind of regard. I'm just going to mention a horse as well who ran too badly to be true a couple of weekends ago. Punctuation, who was Andy Holdings' nap of Guineas weekend and ran absolutely no race at Newmarket. Ended up finishing 23 lengths back in sixth place. But if you're if you subscribe to the old kind of put a line through the last run when it's too bad to be true kind of thinking, then I guess that 20 to 1. I mean, Andy is, of course, a fantastic judge. So I'd be ruling him out at your peril. That's not a tip from me. Just flagging it up to those Andy Holding yeah. diehard fans who are tuning in. Daryl, I can see you're itching to tell me why. The, 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 one, the one thing I would just say about punctuation, if you watch any of his runs, his action is so pronounced. I mean, it's so high and he hits the ground so hard that I just wonder if you're going to get the best out of him with soft ground, soft with ground, soft yeah. in the gold strip description. He looked a little bit outpaced last time. And it's just, if you go back and watch any of the race, it's just so visible when you're seeing it. For all the horses, definitely a talented horse. Um, it just might be worth keeping an eye on that, that that's all. I think I think you saying he, he looked a little bit outpaced is, is very, very polite indeed. That's like saying I'd be looking a little bit outpaced if I went and raced in the, in, in the Olympics. He was absolutely at the back of the TV <laughs> about halfway down there. So... Um, but, uh, but yeah, as I say, some sometimes worth when when a horse runs that poorly. Um, yeah, I mean, and by the time we get to Friday as well, maybe uh, the ground will have eased because showers forecast Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. Um, so one to maybe watch out for um, if you do like what Andy normally comes up with. Uh, the final race of Friday is the Duke of Edinburgh. Um, for Jaria Prince, a horse that we've already spoken about. Uh, on the Wednesday podcast is eight to one at the top of the market currently hereby ten to one Durston ten to one West End Charmer and Laffey also ten to one uh, Deja medal winner both twelves fourteen to one a whole host of horses below a fourteens and sixteens and twenties uh, another race where you know it's going to cut up massively it's going to look very very different in in forty eight hours and on the day of the race as well. Uh, Ed, is there any horses that you think just to keep an eye on, just keep watching to see uh, if they're still in come uh, after Dex? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to sit this one out to be honest you. Uh, yeah, an absolute proper head scratcher. Uh, I went up in a very tentatively Indianapolis, James Gibbons horse. I, I kind of underlined with the course form in the book and with a view to the weather, he's got form with plenty of cut underfoot, but that I'd be trying to kid you if I say I've got a, a kind of strong fancy here. This is, uh, no, I'm one to happily uh, sit this one out. This uh, the last race of the day. Indianapolis 40 to 1 with the uni bet. Daryl? Um, this is a race I can't wait to get stuck into, but it will be on, it won't be at the moment. It'll be on the day. Medal winner is definitely um, a horse that's, I'm keeping a very close eye on at the moment, uh, off a of mark of 96. Thought he was impressive at Newcastle after a long time off. Um, and only a six pound rise for that. I think that is uh, pretty generous, really. But there's quite a few in here that are pretty well handicapped. So I think we need to see the final decks, pace, etc., for this race because there are some very good horses in here who are on very tempting marks. So at the moment, it'd be medal winner if you push me for a bet here, but it will be waiting to see weather, etc. Because the likes of Horovian in here, I know is well handicapped off his off a mark of 95, but he's going to want quicker going. So... Um, a really, really good race, actually, Duke of Edinburgh, but we'll probably one to wait for the day, unless you want a back medal winner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so keep your powder dry, unless you want a back medal winner, 12 to 1 from Daryl there. Before I let you go, I know this is a tough question, given the you know the, the state of the market at the moment, but as it stands, what's your best bet for Friday? What's your nap? I'll go um, Anthony Van Dyke, 9 to 4. Ed? Well, if it runs Mum's Tipple, that will be a proper bet. Uh, in the absence of Mum's Tipple, I'll take um, Daryl on. I'll go Fanny Logan each way. I think Frankie will try and wind that from the front. And I'll be disappointed if she's out the frame because I think she's unexposed over middle distances. Brilliant. Thank you both so much for giving us your thoughts on what is a tricky, tricky day, especially at the moment, punting-wise, uh, at Royal Ascot. We've recorded already the first... We recorded Tuesday last week. We've recorded Wednesday and Thursday. This is Friday. We're going to do Saturday later in the week as well. But thank you very much to Daryl and to Ed for, for joining us. And make sure you use the Odds Checker site. Make sure you download the app for all the best prices available, uh, the best offers, the best free bets, the best everything you can possibly want. Daryl uh, has his exclusive daily nap every day, not just during Royal Alaska, every day on the app as well. So 
very importantly download it to ensure that you enjoy your racing most importantly please gamble responsibly <laughs>